Uh, yes, I will send a an email out with a link to the recording for all of those who had registered. Great, and I will um, I will post that on CNN Connect as well. So we do appreciate your facilitation and working with us. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I also want to thank Amy Perchuk, Suze Lippman, and especially Avery Cleary, who is on the phone with us today for their support in making this webinar happen and just in, with my work in general. Um, Avery is the Director of Grassroots Outreach and Engagement, and Amy is the Director of Network Communications, and Suze is the Director of Social Media and Partnerships with the Children and Nature Network. Um, before we close, we're going to be talking about the next webinar also, but I wanted to go over the agenda real quick for today. Uh, we'll be starting with the purpose of the webinar, and then I'll move into uh, some discussion about the grassroots gathering that we just had in August in Shepherdstown. I have some news on what's new, and then I'm going to be letting a couple of special guests steal the show. Uh, we have Nkrumah Frazier with the South Mississippi Family Nature Fan Club and Heather Culkin with Austin Families in Nature that are going to be sharing about their clubs so that we can um, start to learn and share with each other about that. And then, like I said, we will be talking about the next webinar before this one is over so we can get set up for it. And then we will close with some action items for you to um, go away with. So I always like to start meetings um, by sharing the vision of whatever the organization is. In this case, it's obviously CNN. Um, and the vision for them is a world in which all children play, learn, and grow with nature in their everyday lives, with an emphasis being all children. Um, our Family Nature Club here in San Diego actually adopted that vision for its own vision, um, of course, giving credit to CNN. And I would encourage you, it's just nice and succinct and really is um, perfect for what it is that we're doing. So it kind of guides all of our work. Um, the purpose of the webinars are really just um, to help with regular connections and news with each other, to provide a support system with each other, um, to help us grow and expand our work, and then, of course, to share strategies and models, which will be part of every webinar that we do. Um, moving on to the grassroots gathering. Um, first of all, I wish everyone could have participated in both the grassroots gathering itself and the pre-conference gathering on equity and diversity and natural cultural capacity. Um, I don't really have time to go over everything that happened, but I would like to um, hit on some key outcomes from the pre-conference gathering and then highlight the process that was utilized and some of the outcomes from the gathering itself. So at the pre-conference gathering, discussion really centered around equity, diversity, and natural cultural capacity and the fact that all children need nature. That's really become one of the main goals that CNN is working toward, um, and we're working toward a movement to reverse a trend of disconnect to the natural world. Um, Richard Louvre, of course, was there, and he defined natural cultural capacity as a move from thinking about barriers to thinking about capacities and working with underrepresented communities. So in other words, what do various cultures know about connecting to nature? What do they bring to the table? How are they already connecting? Um, and how can we meet people where they're at? That's really what it um, boils down to, is kind of finding what people's natural capacity is. Uh, and then meeting them there and honoring and acknowledging where they're at and moving forward together. So um, one outcome was that the, there are working groups that were established with a pre-conference gathering that are going to be continuing the conversation. You can see some of those listed there. I believe there are a couple more, um, but there's a group looking at communication and um, the cool factor, so how do we make nature cool, for, particularly for older youth, and getting them engaged. Um, community asset mapping, which again gets back to the natural cultural capacity. Um, how does fear play into connecting children in nature in underrepresented communities? So one thing that really struck me was we talk about going to the woods a lot. That has a completely different meaning for the black community that I, as a white woman, had never even thought of before. So just as we're thinking about things, being, you know, really aware of, of these topic areas, and privilege was another one. Um, so each of these groups is going to be coming up with a, um, a plan of action steps that are recommended for CNN to take by February. So you will be hearing definitely more from each of these groups. Another... Um, outcome from the gathering itself 
was that we used a, a forum called Open Space Technology this year that really facilitated um, growing discussions and fluid discussions around a variety of topics. I believe there are about 20 topics um, that that came out from the participants themselves. So this year we were really able to talk about things that were important to us. Our, my focus, of course, was family nature clubs, and we had some great conversations around that. Um, and there were topics ranging from regional um, regional needs to connecting youth and nature to um, how to make nature cool. Some of the stuff played in from the pre-conference gathering to the gathering itself. There is a document that um, I will be including links. I'm going to give a follow-up email to everyone, and I'll be including links to several things that are coming up during the conversation today, so don't worry about writing down any links or um, websites that come up. I will include them in the follow-up email. Uh, but there is a document available for anyone who would like to get more information about the gathering itself, so I will be sure to include that. One of the things that came up um, that was an outcome of the conversation that took place at the grassroots gathering was that we opened the Natural Families Network this month to any and all families who consider themselves to be natural families. Um, does everybody see the little hand down underneath the list of names? If you do and you know that the Natural Families Network has been opened up, go ahead and click on that hand. That's how you raise your hand. If you have a question or um, or you need something you can't hear me, Any, anything that is the problem. But right now, if you know that it's opened up, go ahead and raise your hand so that I can see that. Wonderful. Okay, put your hands down. <laughs> Isn't this fun? <laughs> and um, now raise your hand if you are already part of the Natural Families Network on CNN Connect. Okay, wonderful. If you haven't joined yet, I would invite you to do so. Um, you can go ahead and put your hands down now. Thank you. And um, I wanted to let you know also that we just a couple of weeks ago finished creating this certificate that you see on the screen um, about celebrating natural families. We kind of modeled it after the Natural Teacher Network, but we wanted it to be more of a celebration and not quite so academic. But um, you can see that the certificate uh, talks about valuing um, the natural world, taking children and families outside on a regular basis as often as possible. Um, it talks about believing that children who spend time in nature are happier, healthier, and smarter. And um, it talks about how folks aspire to share their experiences and with other families and encourage them also to join the movement. So we're really hoping this is going to help the grassroots movement uh, grow and we'll have more families now. We have 159 families or participants on the Natural Families Network now. Um, we're hoping to grow that number, of course, and in fact to grow the movement. Um, with that, Cheryl Charles, who is the President and CEO of the Children in Nature Network, wrote a beautiful welcome letter to families who are joining the Natural Families Network. And in it she says, if you call yourselves a family and you do healthy things outdoors to connect with nature, then you are a natural family. So I would like to encourage all of you to um, encourage your friends and families, and if you have nature clubs or families at your schools or whoever, to, to get onto the CNN Connect, download the certificate just as a celebration, something to talk about as a family and make it a priority and a, and a family value. Additionally, in response to feedback um, from the, the gathering and feedback received after the spring webinar that we did, um, we created a new CNN Connect group that is specifically for Family Nature Club leaders. Um, I just started it about a week and a half ago, uh, so there are only about nine people in it right now, but this group is designed to facilitate communication and support between and amongst Family Nature Club leaders and organizers. So if you're just a Family Nature Club member or you haven't started a club yet, the Natural Families Network would be the place for you. But if you are a natural club, a natural, um, excuse me, a Family Nature Club leader and want to share information, receive information, be a support for other Family Nature Club leaders, then this would be the group for you. So if you haven't joined yet, that's another thing you can add to your list of things to do. Um, moving on to some more news from the network, um, we have a couple of surveys that are out right now. If you could raise your hand and let me know if you know about this survey, that would be great.
Okay, so it looks like only a few of you have actually, oh, there we go, a few of you have actually um, heard of it. You can go ahead and put your hands down. There are two. Um, one is specific for Family Nature Club leaders. There's a leader survey, as you can see, and then the other one is for participants. And I really need your guys' help on this. Um, how many of you could use a $100 gift certificate, gift certificate to REI? Go ahead and raise your hands. I know they're all going to, uh, they're all flying up there. Everybody's raising their hands. I could too. <laughs> um, um, so by completing the, this, both of the surveys are rather simple, but they help CNN gather important information. And if you complete the survey and opt to give your name at the end, you could be eligible to win this certificate. It's going to be a random drawing. There's a certificate for each of the two surveys. Um, the goal of the surveys this year is to gather some baseline information and begin to have a better understanding of both the types of leaders that we have that we're fostering and also participants themselves as we're reaching out and trying to grow the movement and grow you know, family nature clubs themselves and honor families that maybe aren't in family nature clubs. It's helping us get that information, and we'll be doing the survey again in a couple of years and be able to compare and look at growth that has happened. Um, and besides some basic demographic information, questions include things like um, opportunities to share how starting or participating in a family nature club has impacted you and your family. So we're looking for both qualitative and quantitative data in this. If you've already taken it, you know that the survey only takes about five minutes of your time, depending upon how detailed you are in the open-ended questions, of course. But um, I would really appreciate if you could all please post the links. Again, they will be in the, um, in the follow-up email that I send out. But if you could please post the links and encourage your Family Nature Club members or friends that you know that are in um, Family Nature Clubs, other leaders and so forth to take the survey, we would like to get as a robust an audience as possible for this, for this year. Okay, one other thing that's new is it's time to start thinking about Let's Go, which will be in April, but um, both individual families and teachers and Family Nature Clubs and other organizations and groups are all going to be participating. We really want to capture all the voices of Let's Go in 2013. In 2012, there were events in all 50 states, which was one of the goals, and I think that's just fantastic and speaks volumes to the work of the movement itself. Um, but I also want to um, make sure that we capture what Family Nature Clubs are doing because I think every Family Nature Club that I know of does at least one event per month. All we have to do is document that and, and submit information. As you see, email, you'll see emails going out about let, let's go. And um, so it's just simply registering what you're already doing. You could do something special if you want to, but you certainly don't have to. Um, I would like to take a couple of minutes. Um, Alice, have you muted everyone or have people muted themselves? Uh, people have muted themselves for the most part. Okay, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. What I would like to do what now is just take a couple of minutes to share ideas that people have either for what maybe they did before or what they, an idea they have to participate in Let's Go for this year and just share some ideas to get the ball rolling in people's minds. So if you have an idea, go ahead and raise your hand and um, you, then you can unmute yourself when I let you know that it's your turn and we'll go from there. Heather. Uh, last April, we camped in Galveston State Park on the Gulf Coast for two mm -hmm. nights and did ice cream. Awesome. Awesome. And that's something that you were already doing anyway? It was. Okay. And do you have any plans to do something similar this next year? We are going to go camp at the Dinosaur State Park up in San Saba in kind of Northwest Texas, and I am going to try to figure out a serve portion of that. But right now, I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> okay, but you've got, but you've got the ball rolling. So just that's a great idea. Just make sure that when the time comes and the things are ready, that you register that. Thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else have an idea? Uh, this is Alice. I'll share one if that's okay. Sure, of course. Uh, last April, our Leave No Child Inside group here in Columbus, Ohio, we teamed up with the local recreation center, and um, 
we just took a bunch of nature related activities there. So the kids were already there and we didn't have to worry about attendance too much. And we brought people from the Metro Parks and the YMCA and the zoo and we had different activities. I mean, some of them were really simple. We just had hula hoops and kites and the parks people brought some like animal pelts and someone brought um, ducklings and chickens. Oh, fun. And we formed a lot of really great partnerships and it was, it was fun. The only thing we would probably do differently is that we avoided doing it on the Easter egg hunt day because we thought that would be a conflict. But then later we realized there would have been a ton of more kids there and we could have just piggybacked onto that and kind of shared the, the day. Great. So Great. will you so plan we'll to repeat plan that activity, to repeat this, that activity this, year? this year? I think we are planning to do that. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. Does anybody yeah. else have any, um, have any uh, last ideas last before ideas we move before on? We move um, on. Um, it can be um, something as simple as simple doing, a doing a beach or a trail cleanup, cleanup, cleanup or, or a pet rock party in the park. In the park. It doesn't have to incorporate the play and the surf and to celebrate. The idea is to get people out and connected. So, Gail, so let's Gail, go ahead and close with you. Uh, we just had a simple tree and seedling planting party in somebody's backyard, and the kids got their hands dirty, and that was about it for the day. And we, we incorporate it with um, the Earth Day celebration. Perfect. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. And we're, as you all know, we're repeating this webinar next um, on this coming Thursday. So we will hopefully get some more ideas going for that. And I will also be starting a conversation, or somebody, whoever wants to start a conversation about it on CNN Connect with the Natural Families Network. That would be fantastic as well. Uh, so I'm getting ready to let Nkrumah steal the show. Um, I invited both Nkrumah and Heather Culkin to share a little bit about their family nature clubs. And what I really would hope is that by sharing different clubs information during each webinar, we'll learn from and grow with each other as we embark on our own work in connecting all children to nature. So without further ado, Nkrumah Frazier is a husband and father. He holds a bachelor's degree in environmental biology from the University of Southern Mississippi, where he currently works as a research technician. He is a member of the Outdoor Afro Regional Leadership Team, and through Outdoor Afro, he leads outdoor excursions around the South Mississippi area. Recently, Mr. Frazier founded the South Mississippi Family Nature Fan Club, and through both organizations, he hopes to reconnect South Mississippians to the natural world. So without further ado, Nkrumah, you are on. Thank you, Janice. And it's sure. a pleasure to be a presenter at this webinar. Um, that was a really good introduction. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, this is my first webinar, and I'm a little nervous, so everyone please bear with me a little bit. Um, but... What I want to do is just kind of talk about what we're doing here. Um, the South Mississippi Fan Club is just a family nature club that I ended up starting back in uh, September of this year. And um, the purpose is just to help um, help my fellow Mississippians discover and develop a relationship with nature and the great outdoors. And we seek to provide knowledge and equipment needed to participate in outdoor recreational activities. Um, we also seek to eliminate the lack of familiarity and those financial barriers that exist for many Mississippi families to, in order to reconnect them with the natural world via outdoor recreation. Um, we're a relatively new uh, family nature club, so we've only had one outing so far, but we, our goal is to have at least one meeting per month, and here in the South, people tend to want to be remain indoors during the winter months, so what I plan on doing is just trying to publicize and get the name out there and hit the ground running in the spring. Um, I want to give a little personal background of myself now, uh, just to kind of tell you where all the, the ideas and the drive for this is coming from. I grew up on a small farm outside of a uh, rural town called Folksville, Mississippi. 
and as far back as I can remember, I always grew, we grew up um, spending most of our free time outside um, playing with anything that we could, climbing trees, uh, running through our uh, fields and um, harassing our cows that we had. <laughs> um, when I left home for college, you know, I, I kind of left all of that behind. Um, I ended up focusing on my school, on on, on uh, making trying to make good grades, and I kind of lost touch with my my uh, my heritage as far as being a, a nature lover, and I help I hope to through the through the fan club I hope to embark on a quest to rediscover and rekindle my love of nature and also to help others to share that love as well. Um, I'm sorry, I just saw a hand go up for Gail. I'm sorry. Um, sorry about that. Uh, a lot of this came through, uh, came about as a result of me reading Richard Liu's book, Last Child in the Woods, um, which in, in, in that he talked about the disconnect of people with nature, and he termed it nature deficit disorder. Um, and I really had a connection with that because that's exactly what I felt that I was experiencing, and it was what I felt that my, my something I felt my children like as well. Um, this past July, I was fortunate to be able to attend the Outdoor Nation Summit in Austin, Texas. Um, at the summit, the focus of the summit was just to bring uh, outdoor enthusiasts together to come up with programs to get, uh, that they could go back, go back home and start or establish to try to get people engaged with nature or just spend out time, spend time outside. Uh, doing outdoor recreation, and it was through that process that I realized that um, I didn't ha you didn't have to wait on someone else to try to address any issues that you see. You can do it yourself, and the only thing that stops you from doing it is just you making the decision to do it. Um, our immediate goals for the fan club is basically to secure grant funding and purchase. Uh, equipment used for outdoor recreation like canoeing, kayaking, and uh, hiking or bird watching or it, really any outdoor activity so that we can provide those free of charge to um, our fellow Mississippians for, for use when we go out on our on, on outing. Um, There's there is money out there for projects like this, but most of it is reserved for organizations that already have uh, 501c3 nonprofit status. So, with us being a new organization, we don't qualify for that just yet. And some of the challenges that we're facing, or that I foresee right now is here in South Mississippi, we still tend to have a lot of green spaces. We still have a lot of trees everywhere you go. Um, and so there's not a lot of, well, people don't see the need to reconnect with nature because they see it so so frequently, so often. And so there's apathy towards the need to reconnect with nature. Um, also there's, um, I'm having a some, some difficulty finding people that are interested in participating with us. I hear a lot of people saying that that's a really good idea, but nobody really willing to take that first step and actually come out and and enjoy nature with us. And I'm also trying to keep all of the activities affordable for everyone <clears throat> because I understand that here in the South, we, there in Mississippi, there's a lot of uh, um, there, there is some poverty, but then you know, just I, I don't want to, I don't want financial barriers to be the reason that people don't 
go out and enjoy nature. At the present, the fan club lacks the membership board and member and the number of members needed to be considered a 501c3 status. We also haven't been in existence long enough to to apply. So we are trying to. I'm basically trying trying to grow our numbers and our, our membership and put together a board of members so that we can actually apply for that in the future. Um, and as I said earlier, not having nonprofit status disqualifies us, disqualifies us from having, from being able to apply for many grant opportunities that I found. Um, some of our major concerns and questions are such are things like, do we need personal liability waivers for um, our, our activities? So, like I said, we want to supply a lot of the equipment needed for people to go out and say go camping or to go kayaking or whatever. Um, do we do we need liability waivers for that? And also, will we need to have insurance because you know you're going to have accidents while you're outside. So, will we need to have insurance to protect the uh, the fan club? In the in the case that there, somebody does get injured, and are we required to have first aid training and certification, and are certifications in various outdoor activities necessary? Well, another concern is the actual process for applying for 501c3 status seems to be uh, long and tedious and a, a little intimidating. So exactly how? How was that all, all that going to play into the success of the, the fan club? Um, some of our recent developments as of last week um, is a potential partnership with a nonprofit organization called the Gaining Ground Sustainability Institute in Mississippi. Um, this would allow for, for us to receive minimum, a little funding from, from the organization as well as pro provide publicity for, our fan, for the Friendly Nature Club and may provide assistance with running the club as well. And we can also utilize their nonprofit status to secure grant money. Um, and this is something that just, uh, like I said, this, this just came up earlier this week or maybe last week. And it's um, kind of exciting, but at the same time, I'm a little apprehensive about it because I'm not sure how it's gonna go, but we'll see when, when um, as time goes on and things unfold. So um, kind of begin to sum up and in closing, um, I just want to say that if you find yourself saying someone needs to do something, that someone may just be you. And in combining the energy that, the newfound energy that I got from attending the Outdoor Nation Summit this past July, and the idea of Family Nature Clubs from the Children of Nature Network, I decided to start the, uh, the South Mississippi Fan Club. Um, does anyone have any questions right now? Please feel free to raise your hand. And Truman, this is Janice. Um, I just appreciate um, your sharing and um, I know it was a big risk. I know that you felt a little bit unsure because you're such a new organization, but I felt that it was important for us to share your experience and your journey and um, in, in deciding to start a club. And I, I love what you had to say about not having to wait and doing it yourself. Um, just making the decision to do it was the only thing that you had, you know, that you had to do initially to get it going. Um, now I forgot my question. I had a question for you. Um, maybe somebody else has one, and I'll I'll try and think of it. But um, but I did want to say thank you so much for sharing. That was really a wonderful presentation. Thank you for the support, Janet. Of course. Okay. Well, after um, after Heather presents, we'll have another um, time for any questions that might come up, um, depending upon time. Um, we'll see how long that we have to do that, but hold your thought um, and be ready in crew in case anything comes up for you on this, okay? All right. um, so 
Heather Culkin um, runs Austin Families in Nature with her husband. They've been leading it um, based on Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods, similar to um, Nkrumah, for the past four years, though. So we kind of have two contrasting, in terms of length of time, um, nature clubs that are sharing today. Um, Heather has a degree in biology from Rice University and a master's in teaching in secondary science. She is a National Outdoor Leadership graduate and is certified in first aid and CPR. They are also the parents of three boys. <laughs> Heather is currently working as a photographer and a volunteer for the Children in Nature Collaborative of Austin and West Cave, West Cave Preserve. Um, she uses her knowledge of biology, ecology, and outdoor leadership to teach the children and adults in Austin families in nature. So, Heather, without further ado, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I started Austin Families in Nature in August of 2008. I actually started it because a couple of our neighbors actually asked me to start an outdoors club. And so when I was thinking about what that would look like, I thought about what I would want out of an outdoors club for my own family. And at that point, I only had two boys, and they were six and three. And I wanted a group of families to hike and camp together, and I wanted all members of the family to come to one activity. I was so sick already with the three- and six-year-old of the divide-and-conquer parenting, where everyone is going separate directions all day, all week. And so I wanted something that everyone could come to. We, in 2008, started as a Campfire USA club because I liked that Campfire was flexible and would let me teach whatever I wanted instead of a mandatory curriculum. I also liked that they gave me insurance. As our club grew and evolved, I decided to branch out on my own and turned our group into Austin Families in Nature. And the club is basically the same. It's just bigger, and we don't currently have insurance, so I'm in the process of applying for insurance for now. Um, Let's see. Oh, I skipped a slide. Okay, there's one. So we had 10 families in 2008, and we have 20 families now. And um, we camp twice a year, and we do two activities a month. So uh, let's see. We usually meet at my house. I'm lucky and have a backyard, and so I frequently just have people here. Or we meet at a park or at a nature preserve. Now that the group has doubled, we typically meet at a park or a nature preserve. 80 people in your house is kind of a lot. Um, we do we try to do two service projects a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. And I always leave unstructured time at the end of every activity that I plan, which I think does the most for the kids' creativity, problem solving, and attention span. My favorite thing that we do is camping. Um, it gives us lots of time to do a little bit of planned activity and then lots of time for unplanned things. It's amazing what the kids come up with when they have hours of time outside with other kids and with no electronics. They build boats, like in the top right picture, those are boats they made out of whatever they found on the ground. Dams, shelters, they build fairy houses in the bushes, they play in the mud, and they explore. Camping with a group is actually easier than camping with just your own family because it spreads out the work of cooking and dishwashing. Normally with, well, we just camped with 60 people and everyone cooked half of one meal once in three days. So it's really a lot less work. And even the hard camping trips, like 40 mile an hour winds, freezing temperatures, hail, sleet, that kind of thing, are good because they build the confidence of the parents and the kids. And sometimes the hardest camping trips are the most memorable and joyous. The little girl on the left on the bottom, that is her face in sleep after camping in 20 degree weather. We had an unexpected cold front come in while we were out on a boat looking for eagles at Canyon of the Eagles. And the kids were so excited about the sleep. I don't think they would have been any more excited if an eagle had carried one of them away off the boat. Um, I have all boys, and so a few years ago I read Michael Gurian's The Wonder of Boys. In it, he describes boys' need for a tribe of unrelated people consistently around him that he knows he can rely on. Our Family Nature Club has provided this tribe better than I could have imagined. In fact, 
our third child was actually born while I was leading the club. So think hiking and camping while pregnant and with a newborn. She is dragged around by 10-year-old boys. He's put to sleep by other dads. The one in the middle picture on the bottom, that is not anyone we're related to. He uh, And he knows everyone in the group will look after him. This benefits all of the kids, this sense of community, but it's really most obvious with Sawyer because he's literally been raised in this group. I think the most beneficial thing about a family nature club is that it creates scheduled family time. Um, that's a good selling point if you're trying to get new families to come in. Parents are so pulled now to overschedule their kids or to divide and conquer, and I wanted this group to be for the whole family. I require one parent per family to come to each activity just to limit my liability is really why I started that. But usually now, well, really for the whole time, both parents have come. So when the family comes, the whole family comes, which is really nice. I love waking up in the morning and seeing all of the dads hanging out together with their coffee. It's really rare that dads get to hang out with other dads. I love watching the kids of different ages play together. There are so many lessons learned from it. The big ones learn how to help little ones, even if they don't have younger siblings of their own. And siblings get time to work together with each other. They're usually so busy with their own activities or their age divided at school, they don't have time to work it out together. And the kids get leadership experience, and they learn to rely on unrelated adults. Um, the kids in our group actually like to be with other ages. They hate being age divided. Um, and it's also much more like the real world of the workplace, where you're constantly working with different ages and experience levels. So the most common question I get is, how can you engage a two-year-old and a 13-year-old in the same activity? And I have to say, it's much easier than it seems. Um, I try to plan activities that are generally, that everyone can do in some way. And this is one of them. So this is a lashing class, which is a type of the lashing knot, is what that's named after. It's out of Giver Tully's book, 50 Dangerous Things. And um, the older kids may understand the activity more, or they may be able to do it independently. And the younger kids may only be able to watch and play around. But if, even if they're watching, they're still exposed to science and nature and outdoor skills. And when the older kids teach the younger kids something, it cements the knowledge better than anything I could do. It seems intimidating to teach a two-year-old and a 13-year-old in the same place, but it's really not very hard. Um, let's see. Sometimes there are activities, rarely, but sometimes there are activities two-year-olds really can't do. We have four two-year-olds in our group this year, and um, we did sound maps a couple of weeks ago, and they really cannot do that. They can't be quiet long enough. So usually a parent will take one of them over to the creek for five minutes and throw rocks into the water. In Last Child in the Woods, we've talked about how much physics can be learned from throwing rocks into water. Our group is structured a little differently than others. Everyone signs up in August for the year. I do charge a fee, um, which is minimal. It's 200 per family this year, but that covers campsites, day hikes, and preserves, supplies like wood to build birdhouses, journals for each kid, and backpacks for each kid. And then maybe once a year we'll go on a hike that requires an expert leader, like on edible plants or spiders or something I'm not willing to teach. And Sometimes we'll do an expensive trip, like an aquarium overnight, like in the bottom picture, where the families that go will split the cost of the activity. I am a volunteer, and I try to match our annual fee exactly to our cost for the year. One year I got it within 48 cents. By paying in August, it allows me to schedule camping trips way in advance and buy supplies. In Texas, you need to reserve campsites sometimes more than six months in advance. so. It keeps it from being out of my pocket for six months, um, which is how I used to do it in the beginning. I try to get dates on the calendar early by semester so families can set aside that scheduled family time. I think that having a fee and having a consistent membership creates that sense of community because you have more people attending regularly. Um, 
and the same families are in and out of the activities all year long, even though most of the families only come to half or three quarters of the activities. So usually we have 30 to 60 people per activity, half kids and half parents. Uh, this year, I realized that I really needed to be documenting what they learn. And so I realized a lot of the kids in the group that have been there for four and a half years have learned a lot of ecology, biology, and outdoor skills when they thought they were just playing with their friends. So I wanted a way for them to document what they've learned so they could see how much they know. I want, so now all the kids carry nature journals and they write in it after every activity. I've gotten a whole lot of new middle schoolers this year, which was surprising. Um, and I wanted them to be able to show what they've learned being in the group so that maybe they could use it on a high school or college application. Um, a lot of kids here try to apply to magnet schools and you have to have a lot of you know, pretty good resume to get into a magnet public school. And then I decided this year to give each kid a backpack and they can earn patches or items to go in the backpack like a first aid kit or a pocket knife. And the kids love the backpacks and the parents love them because it encourages the kids to pack, organize, and carry their own gear and water. For some of the service projects we've done, um, talking about the let's go, We've made seed balls, which is really easy to do with your group. It's messy, but it's really easy. Um, we did tree planting. We've fostered uh, families at Christmas and bought gifts. We've done a lot, a lot, a lot of creek cleanups. And new this year is I'm going to take the older kids and some of the parents who decided they want to come to Key Largo. And we're going to do marine biology for four days. I decided that I wanted to get the kids in our group out into the world a little more. And I also want to have an incentive for the older kids to stay in the group past 10 years old. And I'm hoping to do a different trip every summer. That's why I'm trying to look for uh, insurance. And then some of the goals, I want to um, keep our group the same size because I don't know how many more people I could take camping all at one time but I want to increase the reach. I'm hoping that the blog will help do that. I'm hoping that the blog will be a resource to other family nature clubs or just to families to help them get outside and camping and traveling with their kids. I've got 46 activities listed on the website under activities and past adventures with information, directions, and photos on each one that any of you are welcome to use. And then I also have 18 other posts on the blog itself of other activities we've done. Um, I also put up a book list recently of books that I use when I need a new idea for an activity. And uh, that's on there too. And I want to reach underserved populations and I'm having kind of a hard time figuring out how to do that. Um, and I want to find a way for Family Nature Club Leader to be a sustainable job instead of a volunteer position that few people can do long term because they eventually need an income. So anyway, that's all. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? That's all. That's all. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke as fast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Heather. Thank you very much. So before I go into a more formal thank you this time, does anybody have any questions for Heather? Okay, I switched it over to you, Janice. Great. Thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, I didn't see anybody um, raise their hand either, but um, that was quite an overview, Heather. Thank you very much. Um, so given that there were no questions for that, I would like to spend, we have about eight minutes left, and both Heather and Nkrumah brought up some um, interesting ideas and concepts that are going to play into the next webinar. Uh, there have been a lot of questions and discussion either given directly to me or on CNN Connect about how to go to the next stage if, if you want to do that, how to move into 501c3 status. Um, I know we have at least one LLC. And Kruma, um hinted at the idea of of fiscal sponsorship when he talked about the um, Gaining Ground Sustainability Institute of Mississippi and that partnership um, where they can he can receive grants on their under their name um, and other options like Heather just mentioned the idea of 
somehow turning this into a, some kind of a, of a actual job where without you know charging people an arm and a leg, how can this be something that brings income to the to the family also so that it becomes then a sustainable project as well and can keep going so I wanted to spend a few minutes right now and see what questions people have specific to um, what's next with Family Nature Clubs and, you know, 501c3 status. I'm going to be doing a lot of research before the next webinar, and I'm going to be asking, researching and asking people who do have 501c3 status or LLC status or whatever fiscal sponsorship um, to, to be presenters next time. But in the meantime, what questions do people have, if any, about those issues? And you could just raise your hand, and then I will call on you. I know there are questions because people have asked me. So I don't know if people on the call have questions or not, but um, Heather. Okay, so I'm in the process of applying for insurance right now. And mm -hmm. it seems unless you have a lot of uh, experience, like your club's been around longer, they won't even take your application, which is really surprising to me, um, and I can sort of keep people updated as to what happens with that. Luckily, we have been around for a while, just under a different name. Um, but they require my resume and all kinds of stuff to get insurance, and you do have to be first aid certified to get it. Guide insurance. But I okay, so that you're you're trying to obtain guide insurance? Then is that what it's called? That's Yes, apparently if you're taking children outdoors, that's what you need, is guide insurance, guide outfitter insurance. So I will, um, I'll talk with you in more detail about that and then also um, look into it, see what we hear in California about that as well. Thank you. And Kuma. Looks like your mute button is, is on then, Kuma. I'm not sure if that's from you or if Alice has you. There you go. Yes, that, that was me. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, my question actually is for Heather. Um, I wanted to ask her about the insurance and if she would mind uh, sharing some of the information that she had because I had I, – was something I have thought about but haven't spent much time uh, on right now. And – if she's done some of the research, that would save me probably a, yes. a bit of time. I have. I'm talking to two different country companies at one time. One of them is called K and K Insurance, and it seems to be the most comprehensive, and I feel like would cover me no matter what I did with the kids. As far as if I take them scuba diving, or I take them out on a boat, or I take them hiking, backpacking, they would cover it. But they have a minimum of $2,000 per year that they charge anybody, taking kids, anywhere. So I talked to another one that's 1200 a year minimum. But that's still, I mean, that's about 100 a family per year, or 50 per family if it's the 1200 which is kind of a lot. And so I'm not really sure how that's going to happen. My plan is to pay for it out of my own pocket for this year, and hopefully that summer trip that we're taking in August will cover it. I put a price on that that would hopefully cover the insurance that I have to buy, because if I'm taking kids on a plane that are not my kids, I want insurance. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. I'd be happy to share. Um, I can send you my email to people that I talk to. I'll send you a... If we can share emails somehow, I will uh, send you, everybody, the insurance that I've talked to so far. Heather, this is Janice. I would um, I would appreciate it if you would start a conversation and just have it be an ongoing conversation that you update frequently on CNN Connect or even for maybe on the, the, the one for leaders so that okay. people who maybe aren't part of this call but would benefit from that conversation or people may have already gone through the process and be able to, to lend you some support and so forth so that it's a really dynamic thing that many people will benefit from. If you wouldn't mind doing that instead of just doing individual emails, I think yeah, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? Um, 
that people would like to be addressed in the next webinar? Well, I agree that I need the 501c3 help because I've been told that we're too small with only one quote unquote employee volunteer leader to have mm -hmm. a 501 c 3 but yet to get REI to donate anything, I have to be a 501c3, and so I don't really know how to uh, deal with those two conflicting things. And it's okay. kind of where what I, what I was getting at with the uh, partnership with the Gaining Ground Group here in Mississippi, um, they're, if this goes through, they're going to allow me to utilize their 501c3 status to be able to apply for those for those grants like that. And that you may also be able to partner with someone like that to pay for the yearly um, insurance. insurance. So, yes. Okay, well, I will definitely talk to both of you again before the next webinar. I'm sure I will be anyway, but um, about those specific issues. So we're just about at the hour now. Um, so I want to go over some closing action items real quick before we sign off completely. Um, and be, before I do that, Avery, um, do you have anything you'd like to add before we close? I think I'm muted. You're good now. Oh, good. Hi. Hi. Um, let me see. There was there was just um, when you uh, all were talking about what might you might be doing for Let's Go. Mm -hmm. I just had the, um, the sense of we're struggling now a little bit with how do we promote Let's Go in a, in a way that's different than we have the last two years, you know, for a lot of people who know about it. Um, and what we're realizing is what the heart and soul of Let's Go is what happens to people when they go outside together. So instead of just getting people excited about going outside for Let's Go, what we're looking for are what are those stories of what's happened to people because they're going outside with their families and other people's families. So mm -hmm. I just offer that as kind of food for thought for all of you as you are planning your events and advertising them and writing about them on CNN Connect and writing about them afterwards. Any of those little vignettes you can share about what it means to you or what you have noticed that it means to other families is just so powerful to influence other people that um, would love to hear those from anybody who has them. Thank you, Avery. That's a very good, uh, very good point. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so um, with that, we'll we'll let's go for let's go. Um, I'll have let Avery address that one. I'm going to move up the the closing action items. Um, Again, I really want to encourage you to both complete the survey yourself, whichever part would be applicable to you if you're a participant of a family nature club or a leader of a family nature club, and then please share the survey with your your family nature club if you're a leader or other members if you know of that. Post it on your website, post it on your, on your blogs, on your Facebook pages, whatever you can do to get the word out. Um, the deadline for that is going to be December 12th. Uh, excuse me, December 10th, and um, we'll be doing the drawing shortly thereafter. And people will, two people will be very happy with the $100 gift card right before Christmas. So hopefully that will help people out if they don't buy things for their club, which is what most of us will probably do. Um, if you haven't already joined the Family Nature Club Leaders Network on CNN Connect, um, I invite you to do that, as well as inviting families you know to join the CNN Connect um, Natural Families Network. Um, Unless there are any closing questions or comments, um, I'm seeing a lot of chatting happening. Um, to, to, to make sure there's no questions that are coming up right now. I just really appreciate everyone's um, participation on the call. Um, a big thank you to Nkrumah, Fraser, and Heather Culkin for for presenting their clubs. I know that can be intimidating, especially when you combine nerves with just presenting and then nerves with presenting in a media that you haven't necessarily used before, meaning the webinar. Um, that can compound everything. But I just want to thank everyone and wish you all a very wonderful evening. Thanks, Janice.